The Vulcan bomber remains one of the most iconic aircraft to have ever graced the skies. Designed by the company Avro, the same company who developed the World War II bomber the Lancaster, it went through many modifications throughout its service history. It operated as a strategic bomber, and in particular as part of the Cold War era V-Bomber Force. The Vulcan remained the most technically advanced of the three V-Bombers. The first Vulcan B-1 was sent to the Royal Air Force in 1956, and typically it was armed with nuclear weapons, and was also capable of normal bombing missions. Today we look at another tragic crash that featured the Vulcan, and specifically XM604. So join us today as we look at the tragic story of XM604, and remember to support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. The Vulcan XM604 in particular was a B2 Vulcan. Even as the first B1 Vulcans were entering service, Avro were already working on developing a second generation of their aircraft that was equipped with more powerful versions of their Olympus engines and were also capable of operating at greater heights and also range. Improvements were needed if the V-Force was to keep ahead during the Cold War of the Soviet defences, who were at the time constantly developing their aircraft to become better fighter planes and to carry more dangerous weapons. The B-2 featured a wing that was redesigned and had a span that was increased to 111 feet. The aircraft was fitted with a new set of electronic countermeasures or ECM equipment that could jam Soviet radars and computers. This was found in the rear fuselage and the first prototype B-2 would make its first flight on the 3rd of March 1959 with the first operational squadron of B-2s being formed at RAF Scampton in 1960. One of the biggest developments with the B-2 was the fact that it could carry a new standoff missile, the Blue Steel. This mighty weapon was powered by its own rocket engine and could be launched at a range of over 100 miles from the target. Because of this, it meant that the aeroplane could then disappear without having to fly over the target which was incredibly dangerous. Blue Steel became operational with the V-Bomber forces in 1963. On the 30th of January 1968, Vulcan B-2 XM604 was flown by No. 9 Squadron and on board was a crew of six. It was flown by Flight Lieutenant Peter Tate and the bomber had departed RAF Cottesmore on a high level sortie. It left in the morning and departed over the skies of Rutland in England, and it was a sunny day with high cloud. Shortly after the aircraft took off, things started to go wrong. After around 30 minutes in the air, the crew made a pan-pan response and reported problems in the bomb bay. For this, the sortie was then cancelled. A pan-pan call is used by aircraft to declare a situation is urgent, but at the time does not pose an immediate danger to anyone's life or any immediate danger to the aircraft itself. There was a severe problem inside the bomb bay of the Vulcan, and the temperature in this part of the plane was rising quickly. This meant that there was a real possibility of a fire in the bomb bay, or there was an issue in the hot air ducting. At this point, pilot Peter Tate then decided to enter the aircraft circuit in order to burn off fuel prior to landing. The mission had already been abandoned, however there was another problem on board, as the Vulcan was incredibly heavy and needed desperately to burn off several tons of fuel in order to land safely. The Vulcan had previously been fully fueled and landing the aircraft this shortly after taking off would have been incredibly dangerous. After completing one circuit, the co-pilot took over the controls of XM604 for a practice approach, but then the captain quickly resumed the controls and initiated a left turn to clear a contact that was reported ahead. Soon after this, a loud explosion was reported on board as the number 2 engine failed and then a separated turbine disc then sliced straight through the bomb bay wall. This led to serious damage with the flight control runs and it also rendered many other instruments on board the Vulcan useless and unreadable. The damage control runs meant that the control of XM604 became much more difficult to use and at this point the port wing began to drop. Both the pilot and co-pilot struggled to regain control of the aircraft. A report from a fire officer tasked in the local area that day writes, During this time a fuel spill washdown was requested. As I completed this task, XM604 made an approach and a pass over the airfield. On completion I returned to the fire section and replenished the fire vehicle with water. I parked the vehicle up 
and I made my way into the control room and saw XM604 making another approach to the airfield. As I entered the control room door, I heard a double bang above the sound of four passing Olympic engines, with an almost simultaneous sounding of the station's crash alarm and tannoy, with the message screaming, crash crash crash. XM604 was completely unstable, and the co-pilot was ordered to eject out of the aircraft by the pilot, and he did this. As the bomber began to dive steeply to port with its nose down, the captain initiated his own ejection sequence, even though the seat was operating way outside its own parameters, with the aircraft being too close to the ground. Pilot Peter Tate stayed with the aircraft way beyond a sensible time to get his rear crew out of the aircraft. Eventually he ejected from the Vulcan, and at this time he should have fired straight into the ground, but miraculously his ejection seat parachute got caught on some high tension electricity cables, which somehow allowed the captain to reach the ground unharmed. The same could not be said to the rear crew. The Vulcan was completely uncontrollable, and crashed on approach to RAF Cottesmore in Rutland. The pilot and co-pilot as mentioned ejected and survived, but Flight Lieutenant A.W. Bennett, Flying Officer B.D. Goodman, Flight Lieutenant S.R. Sumter, and Flight Officer M.J. Whelan were all killed. The Vulcan had fallen out of a clear blue sky, and plunged to earth close to Cow Close Farm, and the devastation it caused on the ground showed that the crew had no chance. The field was left completely charred, and created a huge devastating scene. The Board of Inquiry ran reporting on the crash, outlined the cause of XM604's demise. It said the aircraft had rolled to port through at least 90 degrees, but not more than 120 degrees, with a nose down angle of between 15 and 20 degrees when the captain ejected from an approximate height of 300 feet. Due to the altitude of the aircraft and the low height at the time of ejection, the parachute had only streamed when the pilot passed through high tension cables close to the scene of the crash. The canopy caught one cable, pulled that cable onto the next, and caused an electrical short. This fused the nylon panels together which acted as a brake, and the pilot was then lowered to the ground. As his feet touched, he undid his quick release box and walked away. The accident had been caused by a failure of an Olympus 301 LP turbine disc, which entered the bomb bay and damaged the flight control severely. Four of the six crew on board had been killed on this seemingly routine sortie to test the B-2 Vulcan. The tragic story of Avro Vulcan XM604 is one in which was caused by mechanical failure on the iconic aircraft. What was a routine training mission quickly turned to tragedy, with the controls of the Vulcan leading the plane to plummet to the ground. What shouldn't be forgotten is the fact that four crew members on board lost their lives. The story of how pilot Peter Tate managed to survive also seems like a miracle. Another witness to the crash was retired police officer Phil McDonald. At the age of 19, he saw the aircraft crash. Horrifically, he stated, a lot of us were sent to the scene to collect or identify pieces of the aircraft near to where it went down. I picked up a wrist, and I'd only just turned 19. I hadn't been involved with anything like this before, I think I just dropped it again, it was a bit of a shock. Today a small memorial to the crew can be found in St Nicholas's Church, in Cottesmore. Once again thanks for watching, to support our channel, please make sure to subscribe, and once again, thank you so much for watching.